the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Well, in our Sunday lectionary cycle this year, we hear primarily from the Gospel according to Luke. And Luke identifies Jesus as a prophet, the ultimate prophet. Luke also tells us that all of Scripture, of course, all of the Hebrew Scripture, the Old Testament, points to Jesus. Now, that's a big claim. It seems easy to see where some Old Testament Scriptures point to Jesus, especially some passages from Isaiah. But Luke and the other Gospel writers, especially John, say that all Scripture points to Jesus. So I want to explore that claim today and over the next few Sundays by looking at the Old Testament lessons. I want to see how these lessons might point to Jesus. So we begin with this great story from 2 Kings, the story about Naaman. How does this story, which scholars believe was written around 500 years before Jesus, how does it point to Jesus the Christ? How does the story of Naaman echo down the centuries in and through the gospel according to Luke? And what might it mean for us today in the 21st century as followers of Jesus the Christ? All right, so let's remember the story. The Gentile king of Aram has an army. And his commander of his army is named Naaman. Naaman has leprosy. So the king of Aram sends him to the king of Israel to be healed. Now it was not unusual for people in need to seek the help of a foreign god if it was perceived that that foreign god was powerful. So Naaman goes with a letter from his king to the king of Israel. Now, did you catch the king of Israel's reaction? He was not happy, was he? He said, and thanks for reading it really well. Um, it's helpful for the sermon this morning, Cindy. He said, am I God to give death or life that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? I'm not God. I can't help this man. The prophet Elisha, Elisha, okay, Elisha, not Elijah, we'll talk about Elijah in a minute, Elisha hears the king of Israel, and he says, I think I can help. Naaman goes to Elisha, and Elisha tells him to go wash in the Jordan River for seven times. Did you catch Naaman's reaction to that? He was enraged. He said, are you kidding me? I expect you to wave your hands over me or something and call down the power of your God and heal me. If I thought that all I needed to do is go wash in a river, I would have washed in the rivers of my home that are frankly a bit more pristine and more beautiful than the Jordan River. If that's all I had to do, I would have done that. But Naaman's sermon, servant says, give it a shot. Try it out. It won't hurt. So Naaman does. He washes in the Jordan River seven times, and lo and behold, he's healed. Now, our lectionary reading ends with verse 14, unfortunately, because you've got to hear verse 15, too. All right, so verse 15 says... Then Naaman returned to Elisha, he and all his company, and he stood before Elisha and said, Now I know there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. And Naaman worships the God of Israel. Okay. So, do you remember the prophets Elijah and Elisha? Do you remember them? Were you there that Sunday morning at Sunday school when they taught about them? 
I miss that Sunday, actually. <laughs> These two prophets arose at a time in the history of Israel when worship of the God of Israel might have ceased. Now think about that for a second. What if you and I lived in a time when it was quite possible that worship of Jesus might cease? Some might say we are in that time. I don't quite think we are. But imagine what it must have been like in Israel at a time when no one saw it important to worship the God of Israel. Elijah is raised up. Elijah is raised up as a prophet. He's a towering figure in the Hebrew Scriptures. It's Elijah who is mentioned in the very last verse of the very last book of the Old Testament. The Old Testament ends with Malachi, and Malachi says this, God will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents so that I will not come and strike the land with a curse. Whoa, that's how the Old Testament ends. It's Elijah who appears with Jesus and Moses in the Transfiguration. And it's Elijah who everybody thinks about when they hear talk of this itinerant preacher and miracle worker, Jesus. They're thinking, Elijah has come. Now, Elijah's ministry consisted of calling Israel back to the God of Israel. Elisha, you know, why couldn't it be Tom and George? <laughs> it's Elijah and Elisha, okay? Elisha comes after Elijah. He's a successor. And Elisha takes the mantle of prophecy from Elijah at the Jordan River. Do you remember that story from Sunday school? Do you remember that one? They're at the river, and Elijah strikes the river, and it parts like the Red Sea. And Elisha walks through it on dry land, and the river continues to flow. And Elisha asked Elijah for two measures of his spirit. Do you remember that? And it's granted, Elisha strikes the river and the river Jordan parts again, and Elisha walks back through. Walking through the river, but not getting wet. Elisha is, his ministry is distinguished from Elijah's, in that Elisha's ministry is associated more with displays of great power and miracles. More miracles are associated with Elisha in the Old Testament than any other figure. Now here are some of the miracles associated with Elisha's ministry. Sight restored to the blind. The lepers are cured. The dead are restored to life. Good news is brought to the destitute. Now, does that remind you of anything? Maybe you're noticing some parallels between Elijah and John the Baptist and Elisha and Jesus. And then there's this thing called the Jordan River. Centuries after Elijah and Elisha, a man named John, John the Baptist, would appear in the wilderness preaching a message of repentance, calling Israel back, pointing to one who will come behind him with great power, a miracle worker, the Messiah. And of course, that man is Jesus, who is baptized in the Jordan River by John. And at his baptism, you might say that Jesus received a double portion of the Spirit. Do you remember that scene? 
The Spirit of God descends on him like a dove, and the voice of God is heard. And from there, Jesus begins his world-changing ministry in which, as Matthew puts it, the blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Do you see how the stories of Elijah and Elisha point to Jesus? Think about the healing of Naaman, a leper. Notice that it is God who he does the healing, not Elisha. Elisha just tells him to go wash in the river. But it's God who heals Naaman. And in the end, it's God, the God of Israel, who Naaman worships. Now, all four Gospels have at least one story about Jesus healing a leper. But Luke, the Gospel of Luke, has two. It's as if Luke wants to emphasize in particular the connection of Elisha and Jesus. Elisha healing a leper. Naaman, Jesus healing lepers. Now in the first story from Luke, Jesus heals a leper by touching him. That's all he does. He touches him. And the man is healed. Just like Naaman wanted to be healed. Remember Naaman was so upset? Don't make me go wash in a river. I could have washed in the rivers of Aram. Touch me. Or wave your hand over me and heal me. Bring down the power of God. Well here we have Jesus doing just that. The power of God from Jesus himself. Jesus is the ultimate Elisha. The fulfillment of the prophet Elisha. Jesus is the God of Israel incarnate. Now the second story in Luke about healing lepers. Jesus heals ten of them. Remember that story? They come to him. And Jesus says. Go to the priest to be examined. And on their way. He doesn't even touch them. On their way they're healed. And one of the ten turns back. And he falls at the feet of Jesus and worships him, like Naaman worships the God of Israel after he's healed. Jesus, the ultimate Elisha, the ultimate prophet, the fulfillment of the prophets, Jesus, the God of Israel incarnate. Now, all of this, in my view, is very fascinating and interesting. But Joe, how does it help us in the life of faith? What difference does it make? Well, you know, in our current cultural context, there's a lot of doubt in the culture about religion in general and Christianity in particular. And within Christianity, there is some doubt about the authority of the Bible. Can we believe it? Is it truly the word of God? Does it really hang together? Are the stories just a collection of stories? That's all it is, just a collection of stories. Can the stories even be relevant to the postmodern world? Let me ask you this. Let me ask you, would you be willing to give one minute of your life fully devoted to Jesus? Just one minute, 60 seconds, holding nothing back. When I say full devotion, I mean giving everything you are, everything you have, all of your wealth, all of your possessions, all of your time, all of your talent, giving it all to serve and worship Jesus, just for one full minute of your life, holding nothing back. Let me add to it this. At the end of that one minute of time, you will receive back everything you gave. All of your wealth, all of your possessions, all of your time, all of your talent, your very life. But you'll receive it back a trillion fold. Now would you be willing to give Jesus all 
for one minute of your life holding nothing back. Seeing how the Bible hangs together, how all of Scripture points to Jesus, helps us to believe that the good news of Jesus Christ is indeed true. We can rest assured that Jesus is resurrected from the dead, which means that we too will be resurrected from the dead. We can rest assured that the new Jerusalem will indeed return to the earth, as Revelation puts it, that the face of the earth will be renewed, And that all that we see around us now will be glorified and made completely new. We can rest assured that every wrong will be set right, every tear will be wiped away, and death will be no more. We can rest assured that we will enjoy the glorified earth in the unmediated presence of God for all of eternity, world without end. And all of eternity, of course, means forever. Which means the life that we live here and now amounts to probably about one minute in time. A minute in the time of our life. A life measured in eons and eternities, not months and years. So if you answered yes to my question, would you be willing to give all that you are and all that you have, holding nothing back, in full devotion and worship of Jesus for just one minute of your life. Well, that one minute is now. And we can confidently take that step knowing that all Scripture points to Jesus, that all Scripture is true, that the great good news of Jesus Christ is true, and that our true home is with Jesus and Elisha and with John the Baptist and Elijah, where the blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Jesus is the ultimate Elisha. Jesus is the fulfillment of the prophets. Jesus is the fulfillment of our very lives. So let me end by praying our collect that we began our service with. So let's pray. O God, you have taught us to keep all your commandments by loving you and our neighbor. Grant us the grace of your Holy Spirit that we may be devoted to you with our whole heart and united to one another with pure affection. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen.